And welcome to this exciting forum on science and politics like oil and water. My name is Nadia Rosenthal. I'm the uh, scientific head of EMBL Australia. And uh, we, I'm here because aside from this uh, wonderful occasion, we are also running a two-week course uh, for PhD students um, through the EMBL Australia initiative. Um, so um, it uh, falls upon me to acknowledge the VIPs and sponsors of this very exciting event. We'd like to thank uh, the Science and Technology Australia for convening the event in partnership with us in Emble Australia. We'd also like to thank uh, Inspiring Australia program and the Federal Department of Industry for funding support and to the ANU research training. Um, I would also like to uh, acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Now, just a few housekeeping uh, events, but housekeeping comments before we begin. Uh, first of all, could you put your mobile phones on silent? We love all those different ringtones, but not now. Um, I'd also like to announce our event's hashtag. It's oil and water, no spaces, for those of you who want to tweet. And Melanie is going to close the main door right now, and so the late <laughs> attendees um, it's a bit are not going to be let in, in the front, only in the back. <laughs> so that will not disturb our <laughs> participants. <laughs> now, we're gonna, I'd like to introduce the chair of the session, uh, Dr. Will Grant. Will Grant is a communicator par excellence. He works at the uh, National Center for Public Awareness here, uh, of Science here at ANU, um, focusing on the interactions of science and politics and the influence of new technology on these relationships. So with no more ado, Will, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nadia. Thank, thank you, everyone, for um, coming along to this event this afternoon. I think that we're going to have a really stimulating and interesting discussion on science and politics and oil and water. I think oil and water is going to be a really interesting phrase that we can through. So I'd like to introduce the, the panel that we'll be talking to this afternoon um, and we'll dive into the conversation. What? I think that one's still on. Unless we do stereo. So we'll run this a bit um, as a conversation. I'll start off with a few qu um, questions, but when my questions get boring, I want to hear from you. And we'll do this a little bit like QA and discuss with these leaders in the field um, some of the interesting ideas of science and politics. I'll just talk over the weird noise. The people that we've got um, in the panel this afternoon are some of the, um, some of the more interesting people that are able to talk on this, this, uh, this question today. First of all, just to my left, we have uh, Senator Kate Lundy, Senator for the ACT, um, who was in the previous government uh, uh, representing the... And my, my brain has gone incredibly blank at this, at this very moment. <laughs> I was an assisting in the innovation and industry. Innovation, oh, yeah. exactly, yeah, absolutely. Um, Over to her left, Katrina Jackson from Science and Technology Australia, the peak body representing uh, science and technological societies in Australia. And over to the far side there, Professor Aidan Byrne, uh, chair, uh, CEO of the Australian Research Council. So the place that I want to start with is the hashtag, the name, the name for the event, oil and water. Kate, I think I'm going to have to start with you. It, does oil and water represent the relationship between science and politics? Is, is that fair? Well, it, it, it shouldn't, but in some cases it does. And I think we've seen plenty of examples where scientists have, you know, resorted to, I think, fantastic efforts to get their message across to politicians. And I think the Science Meets Parliament was a fantastic initiative. Uh, Katrina, you might be able to tell me how long ago it started, but it was a... 14 years ago. I've been in Parliament now for over 18 years. So, so I, the relationship's got a lot better in that yeah, time. Yeah, so I know where we came from um, to where we are now. Uh, but I think it's still got a long way to go. I think there are significant opportunities still um, to breach that divide. And, and one of the issues, and this isn't scientists' fault, I think it's the culture of politics at the moment. Um, I think it's pretty vitriolic. There's, um, the, the climate change discussion's a pretty big one, but I think there are ways in which we can improve that conversation still. Okay, thanks for that, Kate. Um, can we, Aidan, is this, um, is, is the relationship oil and water, has it been, has it been something always like this, or maybe it's gotten better in the last few years? Look, I think it is oil and water. I think it is oil and water, and 
I sit at a very interesting space because I'm at the interface. Um, and it's been very interesting for me because I've come out of an academic background, uh, now sitting in a, a, a government statutory authority with a very close interface to politics. So I see both sides of the equation. And they are very different. The models of operating are very different. And maybe, maybe I'll talk about that. Um, so there's not a good understanding from either side of the processes. And, and that, I think, unless that can be broken down, um, I think for a very long time there will be this tension between the two. A good understanding of the, of the processes? Well, what, is it the ways that they operate? Or? Well, one of the things that has really struck me is something like the time scales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you think about research and, and science, um, research is run actually on decade-long time scales. Um, a PhD even, a four-year program. Surely activity. it should be faster than a decade, shouldn't it? No, 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 no. Research advances on a long time scale. One has to understand that. Um, researchers and universities think in those time scales. So even a PhD, which is a relatively short event, is still four years. Um, the line goes, a week is a long time in politics, and that is absolutely true. But things happen much, much faster in the political dimension compared to the research dimension. And I think, you know, it's like one cycle going around here and another slow cycle. Having them mesh together in any sensible way just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge. So both sides have to understand those two components. And one is driven by a very, very, very short cycle. Um, our electoral cycle is three years. That is very short, even, even in international standards. But the actual happenings of politics happens on an even faster scale. So the, the time scale in politics is very rapid, whereas in science and research, it's very long. As I say, decades is not unusual. Absolutely. So, Will, can I, can yeah, I absolutely. add there? If you think about the kind of person a politician is and the kind of person a scientist is, um, he's sniggering already. Yeah. <laughs> so you're so true. <laughs> Parliamentarians have an extraordinarily broad gamut. They're democratically elected representatives. It's their job to set out a vision, to talk to a really wide range of people, to gauge public opinion, to see what sorts of approaches might fly, and then to try and implement them. Scientists look at extraordinarily detailed, unbelievably complex problems and work really hard to try and work out how they work, how the world work, works. I can't really think of two groups of people who have different day-to-day -day lives, so it's absolutely no surprise that it's difficult for both groups to immediately understand how the other group works. It's absolutely critically important that we help those two groups understand, not intimately. I don't want a politician to be able to ex explain you know, nuclear fission, Fusion. Okay. Um, well, 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 help you. Another talk, another talk. <laughs> but, um, but it's extraordinarily important that we at least bring them a little closer together so they can both understand how they work, so that scientists, really importantly, can make a contribution to the extraordinarily important you know, public policy um, debates and to formulation of public policy. Do, do you feel then that um, you know, politics is working on this high speed um, churn? And you probably agree with that, Kate, everything moving uh, so quickly? Uh, look, I, I do. And I think that you know, this, this point about how you mesh those time frames is a really, a really good one. And the image that came to my mind immediately was some kind of fantastical gearing system that allows it to put in, <laughs> you know, to, to mesh together. Um, but really, it's about uh, addressing what is at in our sort of institutional structures that allows that gearing to occur. And I think we, we do, I still think we've come a long way to achieve that. And I wanted to pick up on this point about time frames, because in a budgeting sense, that's really where the rubber hits the road. And for, for, for federal budgets, um, a lot of new initiatives uh, are not given their own line item in the budget. They're a finite program. Um, and when that program has finished, it might be a two, three, four, might be an eight-year program, and CRC funding is a good example of that, but periodically it runs out. And the political argument, depending on the conversation, the political conversation that's occurring at that time, has to be reconstructed once again. And so I think it, I'm trying to underline the points that you both make about um, how those time frames, different time frames manifest themselves in that you know, systems and, and so, structures of science. So let's get concrete then. Um, you say that things have gotten better over the last while. What, what have been the things that have actually happened that, 
have allowed the, the, the giant slow spinning wheel of science to, to get its needle into the fast cogs of politics? What are the things that we've done? Well, well I think one of them is bringing science to parliament. Mm -hmm. um, I've, we've, I've already mentioned Science Meets Parliament, which is a program where... You did a great job for me, Dave. Well, I, I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, I'm interested in science and I'm, I'm looking for opportunities as a politician to be open to those ideas and initiatives. So I guess you've, you've, you've done well in getting me on your panel here today. Uh, but for me, it's about seeing, having a visible presence. So there's been showcases, for example, where um, institutions, uh, universities uh, have come to Parliament, set up a uh, display, literally, and invited politicians and everyone in the building, so advisors included, to come and have a look at the science. Now, not every politician goes to those things, but the ones who do are interested and use it as a learning opportunity. So I think that proactiveness is great. Equally, I think some politicians are getting a lot more invitations to come and visit with the scientific effort in their electorate. Mm -hmm. And that's critically important. You know, I'm lucky, I'm the senator for the ACT. I live, I live in Canberra, so my opportunities for that are countless. But many of my colleagues live in electorates where they don't have that you know, myriad opportunities that I have as an ACT senator. So it has to be worked a little bit harder. And I think this is where science meets Parliament's message is so strong because it's not just about Parliament. It's about winding scientists up in uh, their local members' minds and electorates and bringing that out into mm -hmm. the, the public domain. Great. Well, really I'm going to say, I don't know that we actually have really made a whole lot of progress. I think this Excellent. is an absolutely continual effort. I think you have to keep on reminding yourself that parliamentarians turn over an awful lot faster That's true. than scientists do. You've just got to keep going back in and back in and back in. That's why we run Science Match Parliament every single year and we will until, you know, we drop off the edge of the cliff. Because, uh, let me give you one example from this year's event. Um, we take 200 scientists into Parliament and they have individual meetings with parliamentarians. After those meetings, you get a huge range of responses. Some people come back exploding with excitement. About 90% of people come back really interested by the meeting they've had with the parliamentarian. They've had a various but very interesting discussion about their science, about what the parliamentarian does. Then a lot of them go off to question time. They come back from question time, and this year particularly, absolutely appalled, because they thought they'd met a human being in the office, they'd had an interesting, nuanced, quite complex discussion, and then they go into Parliament and they see the people they see on the television all the time, and all the good work we've done in the last two days get turned completely upside down. So I think there's just, there's a really, really continual effort to help scientists understand what elected representatives do, and that they are not just the shouting person you see on telly. Can I just come in there too on you can, just, just, then, yes. just to reinforce a point you said earlier and just again. It is about the people types in those two areas. Um, politicians, I mean, it's quite extraordinary that they only get into that job if they're good with people, if they can talk to people and communicate with people. And I'm probably going to alienate all my former colleagues. Researchers in the main aren't. You know, they don't yet have the ability to talk to people. In it's broad. true, Margaret, unfortunately. It's really <laughs> true. <laughs> If they you're good may, with a spreadsheet, you very, can go a long way very in Very good <laughs> DVCR here sitting beside me. Very good at talking to their own specific audiences, but they don't yet really, or they haven't yet mastered the ability to talk to an absolutely broad audience, and that's actually something that politicians learn early or they don't survive. Can I, can I, and there's a question that we'll just go to here. I just want to play devil's advocate for a second on the idea that, um, that things have gotten better and, and raise this, this thing. Um, you might have heard the climate is changing at the moment and, and we've had a lot of trouble convincing politicians as a scientific community. Um, many, many scientists would say that so often I have to go out and reconvince on this issue. And there are a number of other things that we could also raise, parallel sorts of issues, where it feels like scientists have to continually raise issues and that for some it feels like we didn't have to do that 20 years ago. Yeah, look, I think that's true, but I think the climate change issue has some characteristics that start to make it more of a debate about economics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where that landed and, you know, we came to a point where suddenly not everyone believed that something had to be done. Um, the debate was about cost of living. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it was about the economic mechanism used to respond to the science. So we, we've had this science debate. I felt like we had it 20 years ago, not yeah. even 10 years ago. And so we had a whole generation of, of you know, a rational solution uh, with bipartisan support in a, an emissions trading scheme, which was probably the driest, most rational solution to you know, limiting our, our carbon emissions that you could possibly dream up. And it, thereby it had universal support. So to cut a long story short, I don't think you can just point the finger at scientists for the failure in convincing people of the science. I think fundamentally that is a failing of, of, of politics um, because they, they, there wasn't enough widespread knowledge about it to see where it underpinned it and it shows how susceptible um, any country is, I think, when one side of politics or another wants to, you know, cause fear and, and, and point to science and challenge science in that way. So it's a, it's a vulnerable issue, um, I think, per, in, in perpetuity. I think this is the shock here is this is the first time it's been done. Mm -hmm. It's not that this is the first time science has failed to get their message across. Does this say something, Katrina, about the way that science, um, that, that um, the issues that come up, the scientific issues that come up on the political radar actually touch on so many different aspects. You know, we as scientists work on, could be climate change, could be um, uh, marine biology, could be um, vaccination health policy, all sorts of things that actually, when it comes to the, the political decision, there are so many other factors that need to be taken into account that we scientists just aren't really trained in. I think if you think about issues like climate change and vaccination, the sort of thought process people go through when they're working out whether they believe in climate change, whether they want to think about how, how awful it is, um, what they understand about vaccination, it's not so much about scientific fact-based stuff in their head. In many cases, and there's some good research on this, it's, it's the set of values you've already got that tell you what it is you're going to believe about those particular things. I'm going to speak sort of for Kate. I think actually it's really hard to blame politicians for the climate, I just have to go back to this, blame politicians entirely for the state of the climate change debate because there are, you've got to recognise, there are extraordinary forces ranged in that particular debate. People who have really extraordinarily persuasive voice have some very strong and persuasive supporters in the media. Alan Jones is just one to mention. And I think also climate change is so apocalyptic. I mean, I'd rather not believe. I'd rather not believe it. So if you get a whole bunch of really persuasive, influential people with a lot of media clout saying, hang on a minute, you don't really need to, there are going to be some people who are going to go with it because, frankly, it's easier to believe that. So while it's really easy to say, geez, parliamentarians, honestly, it's all their fault, I think, I think it's just a bigger issue. And I think on that kind of issue, it's really important that we understand the breadth of those issues and, and where those thought processes are coming from. Otherwise, we just aren't going to get to the bottom of it at all. Great. Can we just um, go to a question here? Um, yes, it was only just a, um, a few weeks ago here at ANU that, that I met Barry Jones, who probably is the embodiment uh, of science makes politics as far as I know. Was he integral um, or influential in the setting up uh, of this particular science meets parliament at all? Or do you oh, know? Um, you know, I, don't, I actually don't know the answer to that. Barry's um, reputation, of course, is so strong, and the, um, what he brought to that science portfolio when he was part of the government was extraordinary. But I don't know, Katrina, maybe you. So can Barry Jones was really history. important in establishing science and technology in the first place. I think he was the science minister 25 years ago. Said, "You bunch of slackers." you know, get off your bums and make a bit more noise. Uh, I think the person who's responsible for Science Met's Parliament is Ken Baldwin sitting in the front of the um, audience right there. And um, he can probably make a more intelligent comment about exactly the contribution that, that Barry Jones made. I think Barry Jones is a very interesting character and I understand he's, he's been round on campus or he's in the next couple of days talking to the students who are in the audience tonight. Um, I think Barry... And he's not in the room, is he? <laughs> no, no, We'd know. I think he was a couple of things. He was very, very sciencey and unbelievably across um, the issues and the, in the detail in, in a way that we've, we've hardly seen since then. I think in some cases, some people found him a bit more of a science than a parliamentarian, and I'm sure I'm going to get a vigorous email from someone. I, can, I, I think one of the stories that we do hear about um, uh, Barry as a science minister that he was a friend to the sciences, um, <clears throat> but he was also quite forthright in calling scientists wimps. 
And I think that having that voice as saying, um, I'm, a, I'm a friend and I'm, I'm, I identify with you very much, but you need to get out and do something, uh, is something that people have remembered for a long time. And I know that that has been integral to um, the history of um, STA. Now, Ken. So we'll just uh, to follow up on that story about Barry Jones, Barry Jones did make exactly that statement that you said. And uh, I think we can credit Barry with, uh, in part at least, forming uh, the predecessor of STA, which was FAST, because it was that call to arms that uh, Barry gave that uh, meant that scientists were mobilised and, and, and decided that they needed an organisation that would represent the vast majority of Australian scientists, and hence uh, FAST and later STA <coughs> came into being. Um, but going back to uh, Science Meets Parliament, one of the reasons that I founded it in the first place was because uh, it brought together ideas people. Uh, scientists have ideas about the natural world and parliamentarians have ideas about ways that we can organise society. And when you get ideas people together from different backgrounds, you get new ideas. And that's one of the reasons that Science Meets Parliament works because in the room, when you're talking with uh, a scientist and a parliamentarian, uh, ideas start to flow. And it's the networks that are created in that process that enable the parliamentarians then to reach out to other scientists and bringing new ideas into Parliament. So I think that aspect of uh, making a bridge between these two apparently diverse groups of people uh, is important. And, uh, and I think the, the other thing that's uh, important to remember is that, uh, that parliamentarians have actually taken this one step further with the parliamentary friends of science. And uh, this is another good step because there is now a, a venue within Parliament to talk about scientific issues and to move these forward. So, uh, so I think the, the world is a whole lot better than it used to be. Whether the outcomes are any better, that, that is a different story. Debatable. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, uh, as Katrina has said, uh, when an issue like climate change comes up, it's not so much about people's understanding, it's about their world view. And it's the clash of world views that we've seen in the so-called debate on climate change, rather than any lack of understanding on the behalf of parliamentarians or members of the general public. Thank you. Did anyone? <laughs> well, did you, anyone want to add to that comment? Look, uh, d very briefly, I think um, uh, the Parliamentary Friends of Science is a really important group. There are about 80 parliamentarians in the current federal parliament who put their hand up as a, as a friend of science. Um, it means that they're keen to uh, see more scientists have more discussion of vigorous discussion, you know, sort of no holds barred discussion of science inside parliament. I think many parliamentarians are thinking quite hard about how it is that there are some, there are quite a few with scientific backgrounds. Um, unlike those who've got economics backgrounds, they don't feel entirely comfortable to stand up in parliament and talk about it. Um, it's hard to work out quite why. It's not an embarrassing thing having a science background, is it, Abe? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> There was disappointed on the weekend. Tweet that now. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, very important to do all we can to help them not be um, uh, uncomfortable to stand up and say, "No, hang on, I study that. I understand that's not right." Just like an economist trained, not an economically is, is that trained. You agree with okay. Do you think? Do you think that those with a science background are a little bit embarrassed by it in Parliament, or, or reticent no, to talk about no, it? No, I don't think so. But I think um, to you know, the, the debates are so broad. Um, going back to your, your original point, that very, it's very rare you have the opportunity to drill down. And one of the, the forums that you do get to drill down into issues are um, you know, Senate uh, inquiries, for example, or, or House committee inquiries. And often we get fantastic witnesses coming forward, giving evidence about you know, particularly wicked problems that we're trying to solve. So you end up with a a, a group of people, the committee members, that are much more knowledgeable because of that committee inquiry experience. But because our time is so so full, we, we will report on that and then move on. Um, but I want to come back to a point Ken makes, and this is about the networks that are created. I think that's an important one. Um, we often, most political parties, talk about evidence-based policy. And we hold that up like a badge of honour. And you can only do that if you have evidence. And that means there's been some research done somewhere. So in that sense, I'm always on the lookout for great research papers that help me provide You're evidence. You're for research papers? Actually, yeah. actually journal articles? That provide, or? I haven't finished my sentence yet. Um, <laughs> that provide me with <laughs> good data about the policies that I want to progress. Rarely does it happen that a research paper will start a new policy thought 
And I think that is a serious opportunity for where science meets parliament, that a new policy direction can be initiated by fine research. And I don't believe we've got the mechanism to deliver that, that those fresh ideas through research um, to parliament, or indeed perhaps the right mechanism is to political parties in the first instance that might be the one so, so to when form you're policy lookout, around it in the first place. When you're on the lookout for ideas, what are you doing? Is this when people are talking to you or when you're reading the newspaper? Or, yeah, no, or no. Well, I'll, I'll, or? I'll try to identify where um, work is being done in an area that I'm particularly interested in. Um, broadband 20 years ago is a great example. Mm -hmm. I know there's at least one person in the room that was writing research papers on it at the time, that was Tom. <laughs> um, so that's a, a great example of, you know, just hungry for good data about how people were using and demanding and wanting uh, bandwidth, mm -hmm. um, higher bandwidth networks. And so that meant that I would keep my eyes and ears open, but the minute that research community knew I was interested, it was coming at me. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't, you don't need to, um, you know, ask too many times before you you know people will start sending you good material and um, Tom was actually a good example of someone who worked out pretty quickly that um, you can do that you can just send papers and, and links and invite me to interesting stuff and if I've got time I'll go and it was a great way for me to learn but I think as a politician you have to be open to that in the first instance I don't think all of us are <coughs> Again, I come back to my constituency here in the ACT. I think I'm really lucky um, that we've got so much great stuff happening, you know, in and about town, and it's really accessible. Well, Can I just say one one thing there? I think it's a very important important point the senator makes. Canberra's quite a different place, mm -hmm. and one of the things we really encourage scientists to do once they go out of science meets parliament is not just forget it at the door, but to go back to their electorate, go back to their home, and make contact with their various members. For many of them, that's quite a challenging and quite an interesting and quite a new idea. Um, some of them do it, some of them don't, but with terrific results. But I think, um, I think it would be a mistake to think that many parliamentarians are as connected with the scientific community as, as say, you are, Kate, or rather yeah. no, no, so close to fair. so many research institutions are. Yeah, but the potential's there. I mean, if you find the area that they're... In every They might be motivated by environmental science. If, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, a narrow field, it's about finding what presses their buttons. Great. Let's just go to this question here from Tom. Uh, Tom Worthington from the Research School of Computer Science and a bit of a Senate inquiry junkie. Um, <laughs> Very strange man. <laughs> <laughs> I told you about academics. <laughs> yeah, the catering's not that good. Um, the, um, is there still a role for the professional public service in here in informing the politicians, or have the public service been, been sort of hidden away behind another layer of bureaucracy in the, in the Parliament House? Um, I would say primarily um, within the portfolio. So in my brief, relatively brief experience as a minister, what the departments I worked with, and I, I had a number of portfolios, were able to gather up for me um, was helpful. I found that it wasn't enough that I still went to my own external sources if it was an area that I had some knowledge about to be confident that I was getting the widest possible range of views. Um, I did become aware that um, the resources contained within the public service are enormous, but they, they are, I think, very sensitive to our time constraints, um, particularly in a, in a, as a portfolio minister that what you end up getting is a pretty distilled version of, of everything. And that's, that's good because I didn't have time to read long papers and all the rest of it. And I would rely heavily on my broad knowledge, but I would still go to an external source or contacts that I had, the networks that I'd already established to um, get, a, get a further view and a better feel for things. So yes, they still have a critically important role to organise and, and present um, hopefully good data um, to underpin a particular policy direction or initiative. Um, but my style is to look further as well. Did you want to say something there, Adam? C can I come in because I've got my lanyard on here to indicate that I'm a public servant. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is a very different domain again 
So it's different from the politicians. It's different from academe. Uh, and the timescales, coming back to that metaphor that I used at the beginning, are very different there. And if I could describe the bureaucratic one, and your response might be interesting here. You, re you require a constant level of activity, and then at particular times, to use a physics description, it's a delta function. It goes up here. And activity is frantic, and then it drops down. So the key of the good bureaucracy is that there's a lot of preparation that gets done by a lot of smart people, and there are a lot of smart people in the bureaucracy. And you've got to do all this preparatory work and be absolutely prepared for getting the right answer at the right time, and the pressure's enormous. And, and there's a risk factor in that process. And the risk factor is that the solution at the top of that delta function could go anywhere. And, and then it gets handed Fair over to politicians. And the, and the difference there is that the actual politicians have to make the choices, have to make the decisions. And that's actually a very different instance, too, of how academia is very different from the political domain. We elect politicians to make choices, to make decisions. That's what parliament is for. And not understanding that, too, not understanding the hard, uh, the wicked problems, as you just said, mm -hmm. that politicians actually have to solve or actually have to address or, or make legislation or develop legislation, pass laws around, is different from trying to understand a scientific problem in all its detail over the longer time. And again, not understanding the differences of those different processes is, is really quite a challenge. So, Katrina, is there, is there an expansion that we could do in, as well as science meets parliament, maybe science meets bureaucracy or something like that? Oh, and we've, we've done that on one or two occasions and we're hoping to do it again because the connection between science and the Australian Public Service is a really important one. There are some connections, but better ones are always, are always a really good idea. Um, can I just expand a little bit on a point that, that Aidan made? I think it's extraordinarily important we don't think we want scientists to be politicians yeah. or we want politicians to be scientists. We spend a lot of time talking to our members about the fact that when you go into a parliamentarian's office, it's not actually, well, you're not going in there to say, Kate, here is the policy proposal. I've written my 59 page thing and you don't need to even think about it. You can just go, yep, rubber stamp, off it goes, because this is logical, it has flow, it's taken the court of all the other scientific opinions, it's the way to go. That's not what you're doing when you're going to see a parliamentarian. You're giving them advice about something specific, you're having a discussion about a set of proposals. The parliamentarian is going to make the choice, as Aidan says. That's actually really hard. There's often lots of competing demands. I mean, often, always lots and lots of competing demands. So it's really quite different. What you're doing is making it, is trying to make a meaningful contribution to that process, not taking that process over. And part of it is, as a, as a part of a bigger political party and indeed a political movement, there are, I, I guess, areas of values, if you like, that people associate with that party. So you can make some assumptions about where the party's coming from. And that those assumptions about where a party is coming from should inform our policy decisions. That's the theory, anyway. Um, and in that way, I think that the, the advice that's put together, the approaches that are looked at, can adopt that flavour without being politically compromised in any way. I think when there's a lack of vision, then it becomes harder for everybody providing inputs. Mm -hmm. Like, where, where's this coming from? Um, and I think that's a, um, a general malaise now as people uh, try and second guess where those values lie. And I think, so that very broad level, it makes it very challenging for bureaucrats and, you know, external stakeholders um, to shape the advice in the way really that they like. Point. And it, it's getting a little bit philosophical. No. <laughs> but I think it's it's something that I, I know that I've had feedback. It's like, well, where, where are you coming from on this? And I know as a politician I spend a lot of time talking about or trying to talk about those values and principles that inform me and you know my, my party. Um, not always, you know, to the best end result. But, but we as science communicators say so much that understanding what people value will allow you to communicate. It's, well, I, it's, I that's it's the point that you can go to, from. To try and work that out in the first instance. Absolutely. Should we just go up here? Thanks. Um, we've had several comments so far, and I feel like as a scientist, I'm often being told that scientists need to learn to talk to politicians. And I think that's true. And I went to Science Meets Parliament, and I think it achieved that. I learned how to talk to politicians. But I did feel it was very one-sided. And I, and I feel like 
there should be more well, effort in point. teaching politicians to understand science. And you talked about evidence-based um, policy. I think that's great. I don't think it's always the case, though. Um, and particularly a misunderstanding of what uncertainty in science is. So politicians, you never yeah. get a scientist who will say, we've proven this or we're sure about this. It just doesn't happen in science. We've all been trained to talk in terms of, we think it's like this. We're probably going to see this. But politicians tend to say, oh, but there's some doubt there. So could there not be an equivalent of science meets parliament that's a bit more parliament oh, learns about fun. science <laughs> to teach about those, uh, you know, the, the scientific process? Look, I, I think that's a, a great idea. Far better for me to t tell my colleagues how to suck eggs. <laughs> um, but I think there is um, um, a bit of, you know, intimidation there on behalf of a lot of politicians about science, about being able to talk the talk in, the, in a confident way. Um, I don't think that's an excuse. I just think it's part of the concern. If you're not technically proficient in a given area, you'll step back or have a conversation at this level rather than this level. And I think it's that politicians always want to present like they know what they're talking about, that we're competent in a broad way <laughs> about most things. And I think it, it, it makes politicians a little bit scared if they're on territory where they are not particularly well informed. And I've seen it plenty of times when um, politicians, uh, and I've you know, been very self-conscious about this too, um, in a forum, it's clearly going over my head. I can ask a couple of searching questions to try and build up my understanding, but effectively I'm out of the conversation. Um, my, my way of dealing with that, so I, I have no tertiary qualifications whatsoever, but I love science, was to make a decision really early on that I wasn't going to let um, myself be intimidated by that, that I would rather ask the questions um, and you know, endure the you know, humiliating gaze of the, the forum um, in a very happy way <laughs> to learn. Um, not everyone has that approach. It's, um, it's a hard thing for, for all of us, though, to ask, to ask questions that we think other people know. We all have to do it, even as scientists. We have to, have to say those things out loud that perhaps, perhaps everyone knows it, but yeah. I'm missing the point, so can someone clarify but, me here? But in the, in the public domain, I mean, you've all seen what happens in a political campaign if a politician gets oh, something yes. wrong or asks a mm. stupid question or gives a stupid Respond. answer. We get fried, mm. <laughs> and that's the sport. So we try to reduce <laughs> the vulnerability. That's a good metaphor there. Yeah. So we try to reduce our vulnerabilities in our presentation to you know the world and to the range of forums we go in, and that mm. I think um, Aiden, you did know, you want to shields us a little bit from a better exchange. Yeah, I do, I do want to add there. something because actually I think you're you're wanting something that's going to be unattainable, and and it's it's not quite understanding that the job the the really hard and difficult job that politicians actually have to do. Um, you know, in, in science and research, you know, you, you like to get a total understanding of what the problem is. And there are different voices, you know, people have different views, different theories. So you try and work in a sort of antagonistic but cooperative way to find a solution. Um, that's not what politicians have to do. They actually have to make some very ugly, sometimes, pragmatic choices about things. And so what they're forced to do, what we ask them to do, is a really difficult job. We ask them to frame a budget where there are going to be losers because everyone can't win. And so we, we invest in them, in them the power to make choices. And trying to understand and solve their problems with a, a scientific methodology just isn't going to work. You might like to think it is going to work, but actually you can't get to it in that way. Um, and so the, so the politicians are using different processes, different way of tackling problems um, to find solutions that are nearly always compromises and from a scientific point of view, ugly compromises. You know, we wouldn't accept it in science, uh, but they have to be pragmatic. They have to get the budget out today and, and move on tomorrow because tomorrow will bring a different problem that they have to solve. And it's really difficult. And trying to map a, a research and academic scientific paradigm on that system is never going to work, I think. Mm. Can I have said really briefly that I think Aidan's point about you wanting something that's unobtainable is a very good point. Um, parliamentarians have a, a similar challenge with almost every different community. It isn't just scientists. It's people uh, across the, the gamut of the community. So they're uh, assaulted by people from everywhere 
coming to see them and coming to explain why their and point of view is, for is best. And asking them for mm -hmm. money. Absolutely. And saying why everything is important from their perspective. Absolutely. So um, while I understand that scientists sometimes feel like with them rests the responsibility for, for everything, for communicating better to scientists, communicating better to their peers, doing a whole lot themselves. I mean, if you just invert it, and see, so Science Meets Parliament, we take 200 parliamentarians off to see scientists. Which day of the week are we going to do that? Which part of their, of their calendar do you squeeze in, you know, a, a meaningful day with a bunch of scientists? I understand where you're coming from, but I think it, it is an un, unobtainable aspiration. We've got a question just here, and then I'm feeling one over here somewhere. Thank you. Uh, I'd be interested to get, hear the panel's views about the implications, that there are implications of the, uh, there being no Ministry of Science in the federal government for the first time in decades, and perhaps some comments about the utility of uh, Ministries of Science in the past, and an associated question, uh, the efficacy of the uh, Office of the Chief Scientist in the context of this afternoon's discussions. I think no a, comments a are permissible at this point. An office which well, has I, had no, a very no, chequered history at best. Well, I don't, I don't believe in making no comments, so I'm going to stick my head in the noose and make a comment. Um, <laughs> so, so I think it's actually very clear that there is a minister uh, responsible for science in this government. Um, every government uh, is able and does uh, move around portfolio responsibilities. Uh, that was done when this government came in, as was done when the previous government came in. So there is a minister responsible for science, and, and that's Ian McFarland. And the government has actually made it very, very clear. It's not called you know, the Ministry of Science, it's called something else, but there is very clear. However, the responsibility for science actually sits across lots of portfolios. Um, I'm my portfolio department, even though I'm a statutory authority, and I report directly to a minister, it's not the Minister Responsible for Science, it's the Minister of Education, Christopher Pine, um, because higher education and the ARC was put into the education portfolio, and there's a good reason for doing that. Um, so science is done within that orbit. Science was also done within health, so that's Minister Dutton. Uh, science is also done within agriculture. Science is also done within a DSGO, that's the Defence Minister. So science is all across lots and lots of parts of government. Um, and you know, not to have just one Minister of Science, well, that's, that's false and phony anyway, because science is all over government. I mean, that's one of the you know, things that I think we hear today, is to look where science impinges on governments. Well, it is across all areas of government. So not just having one person responsibility, well, it never has been the case, and it never will be the case. And if I can come back to the, the other issue that you just mentioned about the uh, Chief Scientist, I have been in two meetings this week with the Chief Scientist, and he is still very, very active, and still making a difference. That was an almost political answer. <laughs> He's getting good, isn't he? He's getting really good. How disappointing. It's been, it's been two years and I've sold out. Is that what <laughs> Can I just say really briefly that while I agree with almost everything Aidan just said then, I still think it's enormously important that there is a, and, and as an um, uh, advocacy group we've made this comment publicly, enormously important that there is a, an individual who is publicly identified with the science portfolio and an individual who is, in a sense, an advocate for science going into the cabinet room, because that's how our system of government works. You have a person who goes in there and fights with a whole, sorry, has a vigorous exchange of views with a whole bunch of other very intelligent individuals who also have a portfolio, and they wrestle over the money. So I, I think that situation could be improved. Um, I think the Chief Scientist of Australia, Anne Chubb, um, is playing, if anything, a larger role than he was previously. And if those of you who recall back to when we had a part-time chief scientist, uh, Australia as a country, surely, that deserves a full-time chief scientist. And isn't it good to have one who's got such a big voice? Did you want to make a comment, Kate? Well, you don't have to. I, I agree with <laughs> that observation about um, Ian Chubb and the, the chief scientist, or the chief scientist position. Um, I, I believe that um, issues need a champion. Um, that is the expectation, and that was certainly, to make a partisan point here, how we did it previously in government. That said, we had some very interestingly named portfolios <laughs> as a result, <laughs> because we were trying to acknowledge you know, significant parts of our community, and I had multicultural affairs, and this is a case in point. Um, we, we didn't call it multicultural affairs initially, um, and there was such a negative response from our diverse communities that I advocated incredibly hard and ultimately Labor made the decision 
to rename the portfolio. My work brief didn't change, you know, underscoring your point. We've all assigned executive oversight of specific acts of parliament. Um, so my job didn't change, but my title did, and it meant an enormous amount symbolically to those communities. And I think it's the optics of being the champion. I think that's profound both within the party and outwardly facing. Great. And just up here. Uh, so we've spoken about scientists understanding politics and politicians understanding scientists. <coughs> I'm interested in the other part of that equation, which is that politicians represent their constituents. Um, so to take an example from coal seam gas, if you watch the media, then Campbell Newman's constituents are concerned about fracking and chemicals in fracking fluid. Um, as a scientist, I'm not so concerned about that because Australia has quite strong restrictions about what can and can't be in fracking fluids, but I am concerned about millions of litres of saline water coming to the surface and how that's going to be dealt with. So as a politician, how do you deal with uh, concerns from your constituents when they don't align with what the scientific community says? And as a member of the scientific community, how do you deal with communicating your science not just to Parliament but also to the voting public so that they can make an informed decision uh, about the issues that are in front of them when it comes to elections? Great this question. Is, this is the oil and water question. <laughs> <laughs> nice work, Kate. <laughs> Kate, I think we will have to start with you as, yeah, as, as, sure as someone who does have constituents. Well, yes, and it's a really complicated question and I get asked all the time, you know, it's akin to how do you reconcile your conscience with how you vote in Parliament. It's, it's complicated. To what extent do, does the collective view, as far as we can ascertain, inform my view on specific policies? Well, the honest answer is it, it changes, it ebbs and flows. There are some well-established policy positions that my party has. They've been debated for years in our party forums and they're embodied in long-standing policies. And I am, by virtue of my subscription to my party and standing on their behalf, bound by those policies. So in that sense, um, I'm locked in on some issues. There are other areas where it's far more fluid, a, a Greenfields policy area, where we are canvassing and we are looking at the emails we're receiving from constituents on an emerging area of, of public debate. And our process is that we feed that into our minister or shadow minister who's responsible for that portfolio area in order to best inform their, their direction or their recommendation to the rest of the, the Federal Labor Party caucus. And in feeding that in, so if I'm getting 17 emails a day, which in the scheme of things is a noticeable amount on, one, on, a, on a single issue, um, I'm going to be telling my shadow minister right now that I'm getting those emails and I'm going to be giving that shadow minister the characteristics of those emails, for and against, what are the things raised, any good reference points just in little summaries, but we've got a system of feeding that in. There are other areas where I um, have formed a strong view, and even though I might be at odds with my party, um, I will express that to my constituents and note that my party has a strong policy on this, and this is how it will be represented by the party in Parliament. So, and all combinations of the above. But where it's new and emerging, it's a conversation, and, and we're looking at that constituent input in as much as people will opt in to tell me something. Sometimes we'll put surveys out and ask um, and we'll, you know, be engaged and that'll help us on our journey. Katrina, can I build on this with you? I want to, um, I want to ask then how you would advise members and talk to members about um, scientifically contentious topics such as coal seam gas in which there are um, various scientists who, who provide different um, uh, pieces of evidence into the debate. I don't think there is anyone who'd say that there is a, a, a full conclusion on that debate or a number of other sorts of things. I think um, you know, a lot of public health challenges, we're still not sure of, of what to do and there are different scientists saying different sorts of um, things. Um, uh, ge uh, genetically modified crops being another one. Um, how would your organisation and what advice would you provide to scientists who may be um, having that fight in public? So. If you're, if, if you're your electorate, it's a particularly big issue in your electorate, what I'd advise you to do is to uh, write a one or two page explanation of the science as you see it, your views, what the, the killer points are, and go, go along and see your parliamentarian and make sure you're one of those people they've got to represent. 
Tate situation, so correct me if I'm wrong here, will be quite different to people who are members of a House of Representatives who have, who have a much smaller electorate to, um, to deal with, who will have people coming in my door all the time saying, I voted directly for you and I want you to go and represent me in Parliament. I mean, some of the new senators and some of the new parliamentarians who are coming in right now, we're seeing a slightly odd version of that. I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully here. Um, uh, you know, with um, parliamentarians yeah. coming in and saying, I, I represent this constituency here and this is the point I want to make. Different if you're from a large, large party. But, I mean, to answer your version, Will, I mean, you do two things. You go and see the parliamentarians, you see them with digestible material, but also you make the case in public as vigorously and as clearly as you possibly can, remembering that everyone listening is not a scientist. Easy, hey? <laughs> OK, we've got a uh, bunch of hands. We'll just go here and then we'll go to the, these two over here. And I was just thinking, as, as we're moving into the future, we've got an extremely highly technological society, not just in science, you know, medicine, even the way um, um, economists and financial people talk, it's, it's, you know, it's incomprehensible to most people, I think. Um, so, so given that we're on that trajectory for you know, very specialised and sophisticated science and technology, um, and we still want to have a democracy, then I, like, I think this debate is really important because um, how do we keep people informed when we're going, we're going so technolog technologically. I was thinking about a far more larger and systemic solution such as formally putting in knowledge brokers who are experts at taking this stratospheric complex technical stuff and translating it for both the public and the parliamentarians across a number of fields. Because otherwise, what's going to happen to democracy if no one can understand a lot of these fields? Can I throw that to Aidan? Because as someone who... Um is, is responsible for, looks after a, a large proportion of Australia's science. How can we, how can we foster that, um, that relationship better? Well, I think the, the question you're asking, you know, you ask, should we go to knowledge brokers? Um, well, we do have a, a cohort of people that would see themselves as science communicators, which see themselves in some way as knowledge brokers. But, but I actually would go backwards. I would, I would say, no, no, um, if you're engaging in research, if you're engaging in science, you actually have an obligation to make what you're doing intelligible to the broader audience. And I think that's critically important. Um, so that's a responsibility that you have. Now, I know it's technical, um, but you've got to try and transcend that. And that, that really is a challenge. And it's a challenge, particularly if, you, if all you've done or all you do is focus downwards, the comment I made earlier, you know, about scientists actually in the broad not being very good at it, good at focusing down not good at going out and projecting. And that is actually the big challenge that I think scientists have. They've got to reduce this very complicated thing uh, down to an explanation, a set of options that people are, can understand. Now, it can be done. I think it can be done on just about any topic. Um, and scientists, researchers, have to get much better at doing it. They've also got to get much better, I think, at articulating why they're doing that particular piece of research got to get better at articulating what the benefits of the research that they're doing are, what the impacts of those research or that research is. Can I go back even a tiny bit further? I think it, this is not a, this is, this is a, it's a hard question. It's a really hard question. And I don't think it's a matter just of saying scientists have got to do a better job at talking more intelligibly because there are some cases in which some members of the community don't really want to know how something works. They just want to know that it works and it works reliably, to use one particular example. So I think there's an answer to your question which goes to the sort of education kids get in, in primary school. If you get better science education all through school, more accessible, more understanding of how to make it, you know, intelligible as you, as you, as you grow and, and get bigger, I think you almost need to go back to the nature of the way all those disciplines are, are taught in school and the fact that we aren't doing that fantastic a job and there aren't that many kids going through science, technology, engineering and, and maths. I know that's a long, it's a, it's a long project, but I think if we don't address it properly, and that's the, the way to address it properly is to go okay, right back to... Well, that too. Yeah. That, yeah. No, ab absolutely. And, and, you know, something that's very important too is not to say that the whole answer for everything sits in science. That's not true. Um, and a good example, I think, of that one is, is thinking about people using recycled water. It's no good in a scientific sense to uh, purify water so that you've, uh, you're able to drink it if you aren't able to convince a community to do it. And that part of the task, that part of the understanding about people, how people respond to things uh, is the study of some of the humanities. Just up here, and then I think we might have time for one more after that.
I've been uh, sitting here listening to this and um, trying to recall the days in Barry Jones's office. I was a public servant at that time and I had a research background so I came in with some idea of what was going on, particularly in US science. Uh, he had uh, some wins in the, his period, for example the ARC postdoctoral fellowship scheme actually came out of his office um, and it was first thought about about 1983-84. The transition from the ARGC to the ARC also happened in those days and also the idea of the, the various models of research centres of different types that we've seen since the 80s through to the present time. And I think one of the functions that that, that office did play was that people with a concern such as the fracking or whatever could come into his office. He, had, he could call on a number of public servants who, who at least had a PhD in, in a relevant discipline and they'd come in and listen and sit and either talk to the, the, the constituent or, or talk to Barry and, and we could go through it later and then he, he could bring it up with his colleagues, so there, it was quite. It wasn't. The, it certainly wasn't the only science voice as Aidan was saying, but it was quite an important voice, I think, at that time. Thank you. Did you want to comment on that? Oh, and it's just that approach. You know, it's in inviting people in. The, a minister can do so much proactively to invite a new perspective into their office, or they can choose to sit there and be lobbied by whoever's got enough resources to walk in the door. That's a choice that ministers have or any politicians have. And it's one that, that starts to you know, determine what their style is as a politician. But Barry's great strength was inviting people in because he had that kind of mind. I, I try to do this to the best that I can. and it, it, In a sense, in e it's easier in opposition because you haven't got a public service to talk to. <laughs> um, so you rely far more heavily on um, you know, stakeholder interests, but it is about going out and seeking that information, making yourself available to those um, beyond who've got the resources to organise their, their, their powerful lobby. And, that, and this is why, again, the science meets parliament's important, because otherwise the only people through our doors are ones with a barrow to push. Very good point. Just up here. Usually with corporate backing. Hi, um, I am a PhD student studying plant biology and what I'm really interested in is a, for a future career is science policy. But I actually find it very difficult to navigate the opportunities which may be available to me beyond one-off events such as scientists in parliament or the EMBL which is only open to molecular biologists. What opportunities are there available for PhD students who are also interested in science policy? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, so that's a really hard one, actually. Um, there is a lot of science policy done in, in the bureaucracy, um, but accessing that is not terribly easy. And the question, I guess, is, you know, do you see yourself doing that as a career? And if that's what you want to do as a career, um, there are lots of opportunities within, well, perhaps not just today, but in the public service and the broad, um, there are a lot of people that do very important science policy work in the government, in government agencies of all sorts. Um, CSIRO does a lot of policy work. Um, industry department have people that focus on policy, PM and C. Those departments uh, have a lot of people uh, that focus on science policy. Now, the question that I'm not quite sure how to answer is where can you go to access that. And um, if I think about that one and you get in touch with me, I'll try and find some contacts that you might be able to talk to. And they will be people in the departments that might be able to give you some good advice about who they're talking to. Well, can I do so can the Cardinal? Into that, that ANU public policy? Does that have anything to do mm -hmm. with that? Uh, that's an, that's an ANU question. I'm not sure that this, no. the, the, the I, public I, policy. I, I, I mean, there's, I mean the, the Crawford School has lots of um, uh, terrific good public policy stuff going on. But sorry, that's an ANU question. I'd have to get someone from the ANU to. Um... I'd be happy to talk about some of this stuff later. It's sort of stuff that I do, but I don't want to hijack. I, I want to answer that question in a different way. And because I've seen this happen, 
is when um, uh, people who are in, specifically engaged in a field of science want to become involved in policy, love what they're currently doing, they join the political party that they believe is most likely to progress their issue mm. and look at coming at it from another direction and influencing policy from within the political party and the policy committees within that party at the rank and file level. I've seen some of those people go on to become advisors and to be able to bring um, not necessarily a specific science brief, but to bring their knowledge to bear on all considerations made by the politician that they're working for. And I've seen those people move into more specialist areas of policy advice within portfolios that do leverage their particular knowledge. I just wanted to, um, to finish now with one question for the, for the panel. In the audience today, we've got a number of uh, PhD students who are um, uh, on the cusp of great careers in science. But great careers in science, I would argue, and, and, and I hope many of you would argue, need to be cognizant of the world around them and the political process around them and the policy process around them. What, would you, what advice would you provide in, in a very short sentence? Three, do, three dot points? One dot point each? I don't know. What would you say to these people to, to think about in their future interactions with politicians? Do you want me to start? Go, Katrina. <laughs> um, this goes back to the question before the question before last. It's incredibly important to remember that Australians, Australia still has a really open political system. You can actually go and see a minister. I mean, go to America and try and do that. You've absolutely got to be joking. There are genuine opportunities for influencing policy in this country. Uh, remember, remember always that you've got to talk to people who aren't scientists. Things have got to be understandable to people who aren't scientists. But take advantage of the opportunities there are in a relatively, still relatively small country that has a very open democracy. Thank you, Katrina. Aidan Kay. Come on. So, so, so if, if one of the objectives is to get your voice out there making a difference as an academic, um, there's vehicles like the conversation, for instance, which allows you to put material out there in a good way. Um, so, so that's another thing that I think you can do along those sorts of lines, things like that. I think you do have to low, learn how to communicate, as I was answering the question previously. Um, communicate to people that have no idea uh, what it's about so that you can transfer across to them in succinct phrases are the key issues and what's really important. Thanks, Oak. I need you to paint a picture of where your science fits into the, the way people live their lives. So I need you to contextualise your work in the first instance so it has a relevance to me um, in all of the broad considerations that I'm weighing up all of the time. Excellent. On that note, please thank our panel very much. Like clapping and things. Mel, <laughs> it's five oh two. Yes, please. Um, as one of these PhD students you were talking about, like you mentioned that you know we should be trying to reach out to parliamentarians, and they've only got so much time, and they have to make compromises. But currently, we have a PM who has said that you know he thinks that climate change science is crap. How are we supposed? What, what, what sort of approach would you suggest someone uses with a PM or, or with a you know member of parliament in your area, such as? Let that? me answer this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not going to answer it in a partisan way. What I want to say to you is, don't worry about what they think. Come and tell us what you think. If I if I you know acted on every time someone um, said to me, you know, Kate you're just following a fad, it's not real, whatever, and forget to follow my heart, then I would, I would have crawled into a hole a long time ago. Never forget what you believe in, and don't be intimidated by someone else's disbelief or non-belief.